What's the typical kind of bite that you get? The two I've caught, one ate the tip rod bait, 100 feet off the bottom and 1,700 feet of water. Wow. The bait had been down there 45 minutes and the rod just loaded up. Ironically enough, I called that fish. I literally looked up to the sky and asked for a bluefin tuna and 20 seconds later, the rod what? bent over with a bluefin tuna. I swear to God, I've witnessed it. Um, but yeah, that one ate the tip rod and the second one we caught, which was this February, uh, ate a jug rod and the bait was down 1,400 feet. Wow. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the podcast today. As always, we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. And today, we have an incredible conversation with Captain Michael Dumas. And he is a private captain, meaning that he will come onto your boat and help you fish, help you with spots, help you with information, help you with knowledge, help you get your boat set up properly and correctly. And he has quite an interesting career. He's worked for Bouncer Smith along with other people, and he's learned a ton on the way. And he enjoys sharing that information with you. We talked about all kinds of things, bottom fishing, mutton snapper, red snapper, the shark situation going on in Miami and the Florida Keys and why that's happening. Bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna, man, there is tons of information and tons of cool topics. Stick around. Here we go. Hi, I'm Captain Mutton Mike, and this is the Tom Roller Podcast. All right, Mike, how you doing, man? I'm doing wonderful, man. I woke up, man. I'm blessed. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a new thing that we're going to do. Uh, we put you on the hot seat, right? So the hot seat is some questions. They are either or, yes or no. You could say neither. Um, but just kind of quick answers, you know, you know, some of them are just silly and some of them actually have a little bit of, uh, have a little bit of substance to them. Uh, okay. but we'll start out, uh, favorite meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, dinner, dinner. Definitely. That's a definite country 100%. or rock. Oh man. If I have to go one, it'll probably be rock. Okay. Rock. Um, audio book, paper or Kindle, man. I'm old school, so probably paper is the best way I retain it. Okay. And what's the last book you read? Shoot, it's been a while. Probably Tiger Woods' autobiography. Nice. Okay. Three non-negotiables in your day. Oh. I'm going to pass on that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> best piece of advice you've ever been given? Wake up and do what you love every day. Love it. Uh, one tech item that you rely on. Oh, my Seymour and my, my portable GPS, man. Okay. And uh, that that's, that's how you're making a living, right? That's, that's uh, it. You, you take absolutely. all your spots with you. Um, absolutely. all right. A uh, couple of things you're proud of. A couple of things I'm proud of where I'm at today, considering my past, um, Pretty much my child, my, my wife, the job that she does on a day-to-day -day basis handling this family. I'm proud of all those things. Outstanding. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? Summer Olympics. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Sunrise or sunset? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Cat or dog? Both. Texting or calling? Texting. And for you, your, what would you consider your lifetime best catch? Fishing wise, being in all seriousness, recently we caught a big bluefin tuna while sword fishing, uh, pushing almost 600 pounds on 65 pound braid. And we boated that fish in less than two hours with a green crew. So I was yeah. pretty proud of that. Dang, that's, that's pretty good, man. That's pretty sure. good. That's pretty For good. Sure. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the hot seat. Gives us a chance to get to know each other, break the ice a little bit, and then get the conversation started. So, uh, awesome. Mutt and Mike, I like, uh, and the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast is because what you do is you, you really enjoy sharing the knowledge that you've uh, been able to acquire throughout your fishing career, and you're getting on other people's boats and, and taking them fishing and, and teaching people. So that's kind of what we do here is uh, share, share our knowledge. So I definitely wanted to get you on. But how, how, tell me about your fishing career, because you've worked for some real legends in the sport and uh, interested just from start to finish how, how you got start to today, where you are today. Well, I owe it all to my father. You know, my, my father got me started at a young age in the canals down the street, you know, catching brim and bass, things like that. 
Um, his background, he was a construction worker, but when he was younger, he worked at the infamous Castaways docks. So he always loved fishing too. And even though he worked a construction job, every Saturday and Sunday, we were out on the water fishing, rain, sleet, snow, didn't matter what the weather was, we were out there. Um, so, you know, as a kid, I probably started fishing on the ocean from about five, six years old. And we fished again every Saturday, Sunday, no matter what, up until probably in my younger 20s, mm. you know, my early 20s. Um, and then I got more serious with my jobs and, you know, I was spending more time working on the weekends. And But I got back to it a few years later and I started fishing again on all the weekends. I started getting back into loving it again because I was always worried that if I did it for a living, that it would kind of grow old and I would burn myself out. Mm. I didn't want to do that. But as I got older and I worked jobs that I was, didn't enjoy doing and I hated getting up and doing, I was like, started thinking to myself, what are you doing, man? Like, take your part-time stuff that you do on the weekend and turn it into a full-time job. So my first initiative was to go work for some charter boats. So I started down at Hallover. My first uh, job was on the free school working for Dennis Forgione. Um, Dennis is a legend down here in South Florida. Um, grinder, hard fisherman, you know, one of the best to work for. I learned a lot and, you know, I, a lot got instilled into me working for him. And then from, from there, I worked on a bunch of other charter boats in Miami. I worked for Bouncer Smith. I worked for Jay Cohen. Um, I worked for Jimmy David on the LNH for a little while. I learned a lot, you know, from a lot of those guys. Um, those guys are all excellent fishermen and very good at what they do. They all have different things that they're better at than the other. Um, but after working for them and building my side business, I got to a point to where I was able to just go on private boats pretty much full time. And now I'm fishing close to almost 300 years a day and just taking out people on their own boats. And obviously most of my clients are repeats. Um, but you know, I just, I take a lot of guys out and show them a lot of tricks and I learn stuff as I go as well. I'm learning stuff every day. So it's, it's always a good thing for me too. Um, but I get to teach a lot of people and I get to catch a lot of people fish that they normally wouldn't be able to catch on their own. And, you know, seeing the enjoyment that they get from that makes my day. That's cool. I would think that, um, one hesitation that somebody might have, uh, in a position like, like, like you're in is, well, I'm going to go and, and show these people some spots. Sure. They're going to have them and they're not going to need me anymore. Like what, is that ever been a concern or how do you deal with that? When you do this long enough, you know that a spot might be on fire one day and you can go there the next and there's nothing there. So just because someone goes and they get a couple of my spots, I'm not concerned that that's going to make a difference. They're always going to have to call me back because every day is different. Seasons change, fish move, you know, so just taking them out a couple of times, them getting a couple spots, that happens, whatever. I'm not really concerned. It's not going to change you know, my way of doing things or it's not going to change anything on my end. Do people They're going to find out the hard way that mission's not as easy as sometimes uh, no, we make it, it look. It's, it's definitely not as easy. I mean, you get there on one day and, and you can't miss. And, and then, like you say, the, the current's a little different, the wind's a little different, the season's a little different, something's changed, you go there, and there's absolutely nothing going on. So, I mean, that's, that's the way that it happens most of the time, actually. And there's a For very sure. small percentage of time that it's, it's on fire, like what, what you might have seen the first time that you went there. But what kind of communication do you have with, uh, with, with private boat anglers that hire you to come on? You know, I mean, is that something that you discuss? Like, you know, once I take you to this spot, you can go back there as many times as you want. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. Like, how do you, how do you address that? Because I, I would imagine that, you know, a lot of people really think that their, um, that their knowledge is proprietary and that somebody else, you know, if you take them there, they should never go there again. But that doesn't seem like a real effective way to run a, a business like what you're, what you're developing here. So I'm just wondering how you deal with it. I don't know. No, like in reality, how could I really do, how could I tell somebody that? Right. You know what I mean? They're, you know what I'm saying? This is part of the deal. You know, I'm taking them, I'm showing them spots. But something, you know, that I try to impress upon them from the beginning is that just because we go to a spot like we talked about and it's on fire one day doesn't mean it's going to be like that the next. And just because you get a couple spots from me doesn't mean you're always going to be able to produce. So what I try to do is actually not give people the fish. I try to teach people to fish. So I'll be like, okay, well, let's say you come out here and you lose your depth recorder, whatever, or you lose not your depth recorder, but you lose your spots. Somehow you don't have any spots, but you're in a new area. 
I teach them how to use the chart. I teach them how to use the, the you know, the, the topographical lines. I teach them how to use everything, all the tools to find new spots if they don't have their own spots in a specific area. Yeah. So I teach them, hey, the best thing for you to do as a fisherman is to look for the fish because just because you might have spots doesn't mean that those spots are going to produce. So if you can't find new ones on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to have trouble finding fish and catching fish. Right. So I try to teach them those skills. That's that's outstanding because then you know they can they can develop themselves as a as a real fisherman and and start to learn more and more and more and of course you know I mean my experience with fishing is as I learn more then you open a new door and you realize wow I don't know anything I need I need more help again to get over this like all of a sudden now I found the tuna now I don't know how to catch the tuna so let's get Mike to come back on and show him how to how to do this oh okay we got this figured out now. And now we just figured out uh, this new mahi thing that's going on. Well, I don't know. Let's let's call Mike again and get him to come over. I would imagine that that's kind of what's what's happening. And then the bottom fishing that you're doing is is pretty interesting too. You're you're definitely you know according to your Instagram, you're catching a lot of fish and a lot of really quality fish. Um, one thing that I'd like to ask you is um, you know you mentioned Dennis and Bouncer and Jayco and you've had the experience and the opportunity to go fishing with them and and really see them in their element like, like maybe not even maybe like some of their customers have, like how they prepare for the trip and how they're actually do the trip and what happens after the trip and how they're preparing through the, through the night to get ready for another trip. So out of the people that you fished with, are there some common things that make great fishermen great or great captains, great captains, like the, especially the ones that you've mentioned here. Are there, are there, you said there, there's a lot of differences between the way they fish and what they fish for and how they fish. But the one thing that is, is true is that they're all, you know, legendary names in the, in the fishing business. So what makes those guys great? Well, they were all extremely passionate about fishing. You know, they were, they were passionate. They were detail oriented. They wanted things done a certain way. You know, they wanted it done when they wanted it done. You know, they, it was just all about devil beating in the details. Preparation is everything when you're fishing, right? Because when you go out into the ocean, you don't know what you're going to encounter. So what made all these guys so good was that they were always ready for damn near almost anything that you could possibly come across at any given time. So that when we did come across that opportunity, we could take advantage of it. Um, so them being, I think, so detail oriented and so passionate and so pinpoint accurate about what they're doing, that gave us more opportunities when we did come across them to take advantage of them. Yeah. You know, so that's what made the difference in those guys. And sometimes the energy level too, of just like, you know, we might see a Wahoo today. It's kind of early in the season or they haven't been really around, but we might, you know, I've, uh, on these conditions, we've seen them before. So let's make sure we have two Wahoo rods ready to go. And we're, we're probably just going to put them in the rod holders and never touch them, but let's make sure we have them ready to go. That seems like something that um, recreational anglers or, or people that are less experienced, you know, they're like, well, maybe. I mean, if we see them, then we'll get rigged up and, and, and try we to. We don't have the time. That's exactly right. And, and I think that's what makes, you know, some of the real greats really great. Is, that's uh, what makes them great is they are ready for the opportunity and not only that they know what to do when it arises mm -hmm. because they've been there before you know and that's experience is everything as well yeah you know, and having confidence in what you're doing and your crew also of course. Uh -huh. and then when you're going with so many uh recreational anglers and people maybe they just got a boat and um or maybe they've been fishing for a long time either way what do you do you see some common things that that people struggle with in finding fish or, or, you know, yeah, they just don't want to put in the work. I think like almost anything in life, the struggle comes with not wanting to, to actually do the work and put in the time. And that's, I think what stops a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, um, how can you help with that? Like, do you just cut the learning curve or are you, you know, when, when somebody gets you to come on their boat, how does that help them, you know, Maybe, maybe some people, they aren't afraid to put in the work necessarily, but they don't even understand what that work is. Like That's true. That's part of it as well. You know, a lot of it is that. Um, but when you do come across guys that, you know, are jaded, oh, I go out fishing all the time, I don't catch anything, you know, yada, yada, it's, I can't figure them out, I can't find them, then they lose patience with what they're doing, obviously. So what they do is they call me, they hire me, I go with them, I show them, obviously, techniques, 
to do it right, the right way, the right way to present the bait for whatever species they're trying to catch and under those specific conditions. And then I take them to the spots and then we do it. Now, hopefully we produce so then they see, okay, well, things do work if we do it this way and we put in our time and we put in the effort, then we can we can be successful what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So obviously, oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I find out which client I got usually on the first trip. Because if I get to the spot and they look at me in 10 minutes and they go, oh, we haven't caught anything yet, I know, okay, this is going to be a little more difficult to, to finish this out the way we want to. But some guys are like, hey, man, we're doing what you say. I don't care if we stay here until the sun goes down. We're going to try to catch this one fish, and it's either here or zero. And a lot of times we produce. If they give me the time and they and they allow me to do my thing, we usually, you know, we get lucky. We usually produce something. So as far as your thing goes, what would you consider your your – your favorite style of fishing or, or your favorite species or what you like to do, like in right in your wheelhouse. What is that? Mutton? The bottom fishing. Yeah. The stuff that deals with the ocean floor from swordfish, 1800 feet and deep dropping for a wreck fish in the Bahamas, 2000 feet all the way up into catching big muttons in 10 feet of water. Nice. Just, I like the bottom stuff. And what is it that you like about the bottom so much? <sighs> I think like the, the stuff can be a little pickier than some of the pelagics. You know, I think the tuna you can count on biting every day at some point. You know, the mahis, if you find them, they're going to eat 95% of what you throw in the water when you throw it in the water. You know, a lot of these pelagics will bite, you know, the bottom fish I feel like can be a little trickier. Um, the, you can harder to put the bait in front of the right fish at the right time. Just, I just enjoy it a little more. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> bottom fishing is pretty awesome. And we, you know, in South Florida, we have such a incredible opportunity to fish for, for so many different species and particularly, it's, it's endless. you know, the mutton snapper is, is right up there at the top of the list. And also all those fish are, are very good on the table, you know, so that's, that's fantastic. But that's another thing I like eating them. So almost anything that comes off the bottom is pretty good. Yeah. As it, as it relates to mutton snapper, what, what, what intrigues you the most about mutton snapper? Oh, I just love number one. I think they're gorgeous fish mm -hmm. um, and that they're extremely versatile. And what I mean by that is like, I've caught them in the Bahamas in two feet of water on grass flats. And I've caught them in the keys in 350 feet of water. And, you know, you, at the same time of year, which is, so it tells you these things cover a wide range of areas, a wide range of different types of bottom. You can do a lot of different styles of fishing to catch them, you know, from sight fishing shallow to throwing jigs, you know, on, on shallow reefs to even trolling planers and naked ballyhoo for them on the edge of the reef to drifting, to anchoring. There's just so many different options with that fish. And growing up, we used to do a lot of anchor fishing and bottom fishing, and it just always seemed like I caught more of them on the boat than everybody else. And that's how I got the nickname at a young age, and I've kept it ever since. And I haven't fell out of love with the fish. I just fished for a lot of other things at the same time. Isn't it funny, though, when you have some success with something, um, you, you develop a little bit more confidence with that fish. And so if somebody says, well, we're going out mutton fishing, you're just immediately like of the mindset, well, I'm going to catch more than everybody in this boat. I already know I'm going to. And, and you I know, think so anyway, well, I mean, but, but there's a mindset to fishing that, that confidence catches fish and, and maybe it's because maybe you stick with something a little longer than somebody else. And they, they tend to change, change their lure, change their bait, change their tactic. Well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to fish for this over here. Everybody's catching those, but somebody that really feels strongly about the, about one fish and has had a lot of success, like you have with the mutton or me with permit, it's like, I'll stick that out. And I'm not afraid to say, well, if I don't catch one, it's certainly not going to be the first day I've not caught one. But if I stick, w if I abandon it now, I'm definitely not going to catch one. That's for sure. You can't catch them. Yeah, you can't catch them on the couch. <laughs> right. But it, it's funny how that confidence and that, and just kind of, I think the confidence leads to commitment and the commitment is, is what ends up eventually catching, catching the fish for you. Because like you say, they absolutely. probably will bite sooner or later, but if you abandon it too early, you'll never know. Yeah. I mean, again, you, and a lot of this comes from obviously experience and you got to use your tools. You got to use your depth recorder. You got to see, are they swimming around under the boat? Are you marking them? Yes. They're just not eating. So, okay. I either got to change bait. I got to change tactics or they're just not biting. And I just got to sit here and wait them out. 
And that's part of the confidence. Again, like you said, all comes from the experience and knowing that if you just put in the time, it'll happen. Yeah. Nice. Um, what, what about the, uh, the situation that we we have right now with the, uh, with the mutton snapper and the abundance of, or seemingly abundance, I don't know about your area, but we, we sure do have a lot of red snapper. A lot of the places that we are fishing for mutton snapper, there seems to be more red snapper than, than I've seen before. And that's not really my, it's not really my wheelhouse, but I do get out there and do that, you know, a, a good bit, but um, just wondering what your thoughts are about the red snapper and the mutton snapper and, and the state of the fishery. Well, the red snapper fishery obviously is an, an amazing place. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that that's the most prolific snapper in, you know, in the Atlantic ocean, Southern Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico for sure. So they're managing that maybe almost too much. Like maybe they need to open that up a little more to the recreational guy. Um, but in Miami, we don't really catch the two in the same place. Mm. Um, we, I catch, I've been catching over the years more and more red snappers, and I've been finding more in my searches for yellow eyes and vermilions. I've been finding more very large schools of small red snappers, you know, 12 to 14 inch red snappers. Mm. But when I find them, they're a hundred yards long and they're 30 yards wide and 50 feet thick off. But they're these giant wow. schools of small reds. Um, but I'm finding them, like I said, usually a little bit outside of where I'm catching my deeper muttons. I don't really catch them together, but I'm definitely seeing a lot more of the red snapper as time goes on for sure. <laughs> yeah. Here where we normally didn't have. You know. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because I remember, you know, a ways back just hearing like Ralph Delf come to the dock or something. And he's like, we caught a true American red snapper today. And he was so proud of it. Like this was something that nobody else was doing. And it was just like, you know, it, it it was it was a rarity and and boy is not anymore and that's that's fantastic for the fishery like more for fish sure. is is obviously good i think a lot of people get obviously get frustrated with the with the red snapper uh regulations because they want to they want to keep some and mm -hmm. and also um you know if you're not using a descending device you have you have issues releasing them and that's that's not fun to to, to catch a beautiful red snapper and, and let it, let it go just to see it float right there. That's not cool at all. So no, none of that's I, ever fun. Do you teach, do you teach people how to use the descending devices? Yeah, we use some descending devices. I'm in Miami. What happens to me a lot of times, unfortunately, because our shark problem is so oh, bad, right? Like I'll go out and do trips and I'll catch a fish and I'll hook it up to my sequelizer or my, whatever descending device I got. And I'll go to drop that fish and it'll never even make it down to where it gets released and what happens is it'll get eaten by a shark you lose a descending device for your trip it's been pretty bad i try to keep one on the boat i go through so many i need to get sponsored by these guys as many as i have to buy to keep on the boat um, but luckily for me lots of times most of the times i'm good enough to where i don't really accidentally catch too many fish that i have to let go yeah you know so i don't run into that issue too much from having to let like i won't go snowy fishing out of season you know, so there's not too much of that stuff. I'm, I'm pinpointing specific how, fish and just catch. How it. could a uh, a person that's not as experienced as you um, get better at that? Like specifically, not catching fish that you you don't you're you're not going to keep. Like you mentioned the snowy grouper, but what are some ways that that people could um, you know get better at at target? It, I, I, what it comes down to really is targeting the fish that you're really after and reducing the bycatch for things that might be out of season, I guess. So what would you uh, advise there? I just go with me enough, enough to learn what lives where, what depths and how to target certain things. And then over, obviously you're gonna accidentally catch a fish here or there. You know, you can't control what eats your bait. But if you put your bait where the fish you wanna catch is, there's a good chance that's what you're gonna catch. You know what I mean? So if somebody's going to fish for yellow eyes, I'm going to keep, I'm going to advise them, hey, stay inside at 300 or 350. And there's a good chance you're not going to catch a snowy. The minute you get outside of that, there's a chance you're going to start having to release some small snowies and stuff while you're doing it. So I just kind of teach, hey, if you want to avoid catching this fish, just avoid this depth or these areas. And if you want to focus on this, you go to this area. But just experience and time will teach you, hey, you know, I can't go here this time of year. Otherwise, I'm going to catch this somewhere. I have to let it go. Yeah. <clears throat> that's that's good advice and and <clears throat> it's kind of funny because you know when some people you always have these cycles of of fishing and you get started in fishing 
and you just want to catch. I mean, the the thought of avoiding fish is <laughs> is crazy to some people because you know they just want to catch any fish, right? So the thought of like being very particular about what you catch, but as an ethical angler or as somebody that gets uh, a little more experienced, y- you you don't want to be catching the fish that are out of season. You don't want to be catching the fish that you, that you can't release because of the sharks or because of, of, I mean, maybe you can with a descending device if you don't have shark problems, but that's uh that's kind of a funny thing for some people that are getting started in fishing just to be like avoid fish. Well, the thing is once they learn enough, they'll realize that if all you're trying to do is catch fish, I can teach them many other ways to go catch fish that they don't have to worry about releasing. You know, if you just want your rod bent, I got you covered. But, you know, definitely like avoiding snowies and other fish that are out of season. I got them covered, too, on that. I can teach. So I'm sure that there are people in the audience right now that said, wow, if I yeah, I want my rod bent. And and so what 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 are you talking about? Like what what would you do if somebody said, listen, man, we just want action. Oh, man, there, I have lots of options on any given day. Um, luckily for me in Miami, one of the best things that you can do in Miami to just bend your rod is go fish some of the wrecks. Um, go fish wrecks with live bait, hit the bottom, drift over the top of these wrecks with a live bait, and something will tip. Uh, if anything's feeding on that particular day, you're going to hook a jack, a snapper, a grouper, a kingfish, a paracuda, a bonita. A t- something is going to eat your bait. You are going to bend the rod. If there's anything happening your rod will bend over. I guarantee that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's talk about some of the, uh, some of uh, maybe uh, when you were working for Bouncer Smith, you know, I had Bouncer on the podcast. He's an amazing storyteller. He, he really, I'm sure that, that's one of the reasons why people enjoy fishing with him so much is he's obviously a very good fisherman for sure, but he's an entertainer. He's a storyteller. He is somebody that is, I, I don't know if you could have a bad day. I've, I've never fished with him for eight hours, but I spent a few hours with him and I was like, I don't, I don't know if you could necessarily have a bad day with this guy. He is, he's got so many stories and he's fished with so many different people from celebrities to outstanding anglers to world record holders to you know just to just the the grind that he put in for so long is interesting i'm just wondering like uh when you think about fishing you know with with bouncer and working for him like what what comes to mind do you have any stories of of fishing with him well i got to fish for him for a short period of time when his when his shoulder was pretty bad um, when he couldn't really run the whole show himself, so he had me and another mate fishing with him while he was on the boat. So he was in a little pain. So some of the days were a little tough on him. Um, but for those three months, four months that I worked for him, I mean, we caught tons of fish. I learned a lot, even about Miami, that I didn't know about. You know, I obviously learned lots of techniques, and tricks, and, and little things, and a lot of little scientific things too, like stuff that I can't necessarily remember because it wasn't that important for me to remember and put it in because I only have so much space up here. Um, but he knows, man, he's like a scientist when it comes to fish. He knows like what water temperatures they like, and he knows like all about all kinds of stuff. So wor- working for him was definitely a hell of a lot of fun. We caught a ton of fish. I'm trying to think about one specific, well, we hooked a giant yellow thing. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was, ironically enough, when I started working for him, it was right around the time of year when it's possible where you could catch one. I think it was like February, and I fished on his boat, like February through about late April, March, early May. Um, and we were out there, and I, from time to time, we'd get certain conditions, and I'd be like, man, this reminds me of when me and my dad hooked this elephant. We don't have elephants here anymore, Mike. And this is going back to like 2014, 2015. It's like, we don't have any more elephants here. They're gone. So um, one day we're out there and we just released a sail and it's blowing out of the Northwest hard. And the t- a few times I've hooked the elephant too because in Miami it was on a Northwest wind, hard Northwest wind. So I said something. I was like, this reminds me of one day, just me and my dad hooked a big elephant. He's like, Mike, I've told you, no elephants here. So we had just released a sail. We're driving back offshore. The kite baits are still out. Half of them are dead. They're just flopping. We're dragging them back offshore. We're going to reset up when we get back out there. And all of a sudden this fish comes up and piles on one of these dead herring and the customer's like oh it looked like a sailfish like one of these fish we just caught you know we're like oh, okay we're fighting a fish and we're looking at each other and this thing's hauling ass on the surface changing directions heading offshore and just moving real fast and just not seeming to slow down and i look at him and he looks at me and i look at the other mate and i go bro 
this this looks like the man. He's like, yeah. If it was a walk, it would have slowed down a long time ago. It's like nothing else runs that fast in the ocean, you know, that, that we could possibly hook this time of year. And two and a half hours later, we this thing comes up on the surface. His sickle fins are three and a half feet long, and it's probably pushing 180 pounds. And we proceeded to fight it for the next couple of hours. And unluckily for us, it got tail wrapped and ended up popping us off at the leader. Mm. But that was probably one of the coolest experiences, you know, that I got to experience while working for Balancer. Did he uh, did he retract his statement about that they're all gone? Well, if he didn't, then he should now because <laughs> a lot more have shown up here in the last few years. But ironically enough, we didn't have a, a harpoon on the boat. Balancer never carried one. But I bet you if you go ask him, he'll tell you that ever since that day, he's always had, he's had one on the boat since then. Because if we had a harpoon that day, that fish would have died. You know, we had plenty of opportunities to put a harpoon in it. We just never got close enough to hit it with a seven-foot gaff. Wow. How big do you think that fish was? Well over 150, probably, if I had to guess, probably 175, 180, something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I got to see them up close and personal. And what do you think the conditions are? Hard northwest wind, what time of the year? No, this, those were just times when I hooked a few. Um, a lot of the guys have been hooking them lately, fishing the springtime on a southeast, you know, normal good kite weather, southeast, northeast, east wind you know, just flying the rags for sales and we're just bycatch. But there's a hell of a lot more around now than there was seven, eight, nine years ago. That's for sure. You can almost, if you spend a season fishing off Miami with the kites from February to April, there's a good chance you're going to hook at least one. I mean, Dean Panos caught three this year. Wow. What about bluefin? Yeah. More of those showing up too. We're starting to see a lot more traveling south. Uh, and then a lot more of the guys that are out there sword fishing are hooking a lot more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've caught in the last four years, we caught two of them. That yeah. one we caught recently was the second one that we've caught sword fishing. That's and I'm crazy. not sword fishing that much. I sword fish maybe 60 days a year. Yeah. And when you catch them sword fishing, are you catching them all the way down on the bottom? Or are they biting it on the drop or they're or bringing it up? Or what? what's the typical kind of bite that you get? The two I've caught, one ate the tip rod bait. 100 feet off the bottom and 1,700 feet of water. Wow. The bait had been down there 45 minutes, and the rod just loaded up. Ironically enough, I called that fish. I literally looked up to the sky and asked for a bluefin tuna, and 20 seconds later, the rod what? bent over with a bluefin tuna. I swear to God, I have witnesses. Um, but, yeah, that one ate the tip rod, and the second one we caught, which was this February, uh, ate a jug rod, and the bait was down 1,400 feet. Wow. That's, that's wild, man. That yep. really is wild. So I wonder, you know, for, for a long time, you know, nobody was catching any blue fins, but they're only sword fishing at night there for a while. And then, then you get the daytime sword fishing. I mean, you kind of wonder on something like that and, and sometimes on the great white shark and stuff like that, where they, they are tagging the sharks and now we can see where they are. And they're obviously coming right by Miami. They're down in the keys. They're all over the place. You're like, what are these, these things have got to been here all the time. And, sure. and so the trend of, of sword fishing is now somehow intersecting the bluefin where it wasn't before. And so a few are getting caught here and there. And it's like, huh, like were they here all the time or has something changed? Or like, yeah, I always wonder about things like that. Well, like, you always hear about the stories of guys hooking fish. I couldn't stop it. It dumped an 80. It never right. slowed down, blah, blah, blah. I think now we just have, you know, with the invention of braid, you know, we have heavier, more durable line and smaller thicknesses. So we can do more with this stuff and we can put baits in places we normally wouldn't, they weren't able to put them before. And that's why we're catching fish we normally haven't been catching. Like, for instance, the OPA. You know what the opa yeah, yeah. is, right? The yeah. fish that's normally caught in California yeah. in the middle of the water. There, one of my friends caught one uh, off of Miami, um, Jeff Arias. He caught a big, beautiful one. and uh, You never know what's out there, man. You just got to put the bait down there. I know. Are people catching more and more of those? Or is that I've becoming heard of more... a couple. I'm just using that as an example. Like yeah. we didn't even know those things existed in the Atlantic ocean right. and here. And all of a sudden we're catching, you know, like we're finding out just by putting these baits out in deep water and, Drifting along the edge of the continental shelf and Man, you never know what the heck You know, it catch. goes back to exactly what we were talking about before. It's like there somebody would have never had the confidence to drop a bait there before we started catching daytime swordfish and all that stuff. It's like, what what are you doing out there? You don't have any confidence. And so maybe you drop it all the way to the bottom and you're like, ah, stick it out for an hour. 
Ah, nothing bit. Okay, well, maybe that was a waste of time. Um, but it comes down to confidence and commitment. And now sure. that you're, you're expecting to catch a swordfish, you're sticking it out in places that not a lot of baits go down there. Never know what you're going to catch. I mean, even the scientists, um, you know, discover a fish that they feel like is, is, um, is, is prehistoric and extinct, the coelacanth. And, uh, uh -huh. and then, you know, somebody gets one in a net. They're like, huh, well, maybe we should put other nets down there and see what's down there. And then they, then they start coming up and it's like, oh, this fish isn't extinct. It was just that the intersection of fishing techniques and, and where that fish lived didn't make any sense. Well, you think about it. I mean, the ocean is really like outer space. You know what I mean? Like the bottom of the ocean, we know less about the bottom of the ocean than we do know about outer space, you know? So there's got to be all kinds of stuff that we don't know about, that we have no idea even exists yet, and stuff that we thought was dead a long time ago still existing on the surface. There's got to be. I think so. Too much space. I mean, I, I, feel, I think that that's far more uh, logical and reasonable than that there's a Sasquatch in 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 north georgia somewhere that well that's just the thing like how does how does he go this long without being undiscovered i mean you know it's I mean? possible i love the idea of it right like me too i love well, yeah. the idea that there could be something out there that and sasquatch is really cool i thought i was going to wear my sasquatch shirt today but i ended up it feels it's black and it feels exactly like this one so when i felt reached my drawer i actually thought i had it on there but they have one that has it's called tacta squatch and it's got uh, it's got Sasquatch on there, but I, I like the idea of Sasquatch, but I have, I have, uh, since abandoned my, my, my hope that there is a Sasquatch because of a couple of things. One trail cameras are very common these days. I mean, man, we were elk hunting in Montana and we went so far back and we get where we think, I mean, it feels like no one has been there. We don't see any trails. We don't see anything. And we get to this place and there's a trail camera. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, somebody's been here and somebody's monitoring this spot and somebody's planning on coming back. And we are way out, way out. And uh, there's a trail camera. And there, you know, trail cameras have gotten less and less expensive and people can afford more and more and more of them. And they're putting them in more and more and more places. And then people have cell phones in their pocket everywhere so yeah, we would have there would have been undeniable evidence by now i mean because there is undeniable evidence as the trail cameras get in more and more places you start to see more and more mountain lions more and more black bears in places like in in neighborhoods and and places that nobody has seen a bear in 20 years but somebody catches one on their on their trail camera that's in their backyard or their or their doorbell camera that's that's going out and you see a black bear walk down the street in an urban area, but yet a black bear there hasn't been sighted there in 20, 30 years. But because everybody has all these cameras all the time, you pick it up, you could pick it up. Um, and that's where I think that I've, I've kind of lost my, I've kind of lost the my, my faith. Watch. I mean, I, 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 I want to believe, I think it's a cool idea that, well, when you think about how many, like how many different people across the globe have stories of a, of a type of a Sasquatch or abominable snowman or the Yeti, it kind of gives you hope, you know, that all these different people have, have these stories, but where's the proof, man? I know. And if you ever see proof, it's super shaky. And, and then so many people have, have faked it that now it's like, wow, well, I, the I boy who cried wolf thing. It's like, you know, well, you don't know what to believe. But the point of the story is, that the ocean is a completely different thing. We don't have trail cameras all over the ocean. We don't have, I mean, there are places in the ocean that we've never seen before to your point, And there could be anything down there, anything. And, and all uh, kinds of cool things, man. The stuff that lives out down in the deep is really cool. Yeah. I mean, just like you were talking about, you know, there, there are people that say, I hooked something and it dumped an 80 and uh, who knows what that was. Or it must have been a tail hook something or, you know, it was it was something. Or or they were catching a, a, a giant, you know, shark and then something else came and ate that shark. Well, I mean, nobody would say, well, it was probably a great white. But now when you look at the tagging data and how they track these sharks it's like well yeah it could have been a great white the thing was likely, i mean they I mean, come right through there they come right through there and and so now we have actually the confidence of being like well like, yeah it could have been 
it could have been a great white. Like that's not that's not crazy because we have the 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 and it goes back to the 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 confidence. Like you have the confidence that you know now that great whites come through here regularly, and we have several tagged ones. How many are not tagged? So if you're seeing the several tagged ones coming through these areas regularly, it's how ten many more other, that aren't? Uh, uh, at least, right? Right. But. Um, that's that that starts a different conversation about the shark population uh, in South Florida, Miami. I, I don't. I mean, and you already mentioned that it's that, that they're swarming. It's out of control. Uh, what What do you think is? Do, do you have any explanation for it or or uh, rationale of why we're seeing more? Or, or I don't know. Tell me what your experience is. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. But where where do you think the shark population is now versus when you were a kid fishing with your dad? Well, when I was a kid fishing with my dad, I really didn't have to worry about too many fish eating my other fish on my line. You know, I think just back then when you could kill sharks, anyone, you know, any any species, I think those fish associated people with danger. You know what I mean? There's, those animals are smart. You know, they learn quick. Um, so I think now with the fact that you're not able to kill them, They've slowly learned over time, okay, I can be near vests. I can be near boats. I don't have to worry about them catching me and killing me. They're going to let me go. Now what I'm going to do is I know that I can get some free food. So not only the problem is we're feeding them. You know, there's places, I think, up in Jupiter, they have these shark feeding tours. And in Bimini, they're doing the shark feeding stuff. That's helping them associate people with free food. And then they're learning, hey, if I go sit up under this boat, they're going to eventually hook a fish and it's going to be prime for me to just go ahead and steal it from and take them off their line. So when you couple the fact that these fish are smart, they're learning on top of the fact that they're multiplying at such a rapid rate because they're protected. So what you have is a bunch of smart sharks in the area and it's so hard to get a fish past them. Super you know, hard. And then on top, and then you have the Goliaths too. They're another major problem. You know, almost any wreck you go to anywhere on the coast of Florida on any coast, it's going to have Goliath groupers on it. When I was a kid, they were almost extinct. You know, mm -hmm. you couldn't keep one. You know, you only place I ever caught one, I went to Everglades National Park and caught babies. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, now they're everywhere. They are. You know, so you have, I think stuff's being mismanaged a little bit, and that's what's, what's running into some problems. It's very interesting to have some science people on the podcast to talk about the Goliath grouper and the opening of the season. And and one of the things I didn't, I didn't realize uh, about, it got, kind of gave me a lot of hope because th they were talking about um, the fact that they take catch data is one of the one of the sources of information that they'll use to monitor the the health of a of a species. So we, you'll you'll have somebody come up to you at the boat ramp and they'll ask you how many fish you caught. You know, I'm sure that's happened to you a bunch of times. Uh, and they'll they'll do that. You know, they'll have somebody sitting at a popular spot and they'll they'll be asking a lot of people. Uh, you're, sometimes there'll be angler surveys that they, that they send out in the mail or whatever. But for a long time, the Goliath grouper was completely closed. And so there was zero catch data, zero catch data. So that is just a, a source of information, whether it's accurate or not accurate or whatever, that source just does not exist. And yet they did open the season on an experimental level to allow 200 fish to be caught of a certain size. And really, I thought that that was pretty good for, for, um, for anglers, for conservation, and for the hope that maybe th there would even be a consideration that they would open it up you know, it further, right, to, to allow other, other fish to be caught. But without that catch data, they, they opened the season anyway which is pretty interesting. And I don't know why that's not happening with Red Snapper to expand the season and, and have a longer season or to allow for more well, fish. I, th I think, not to cut you off, but I think they did expand it this year yeah. in golf. Yeah, they did a little bit. Um, but, you know, to some people's opinion, not anywhere nearly enough. Right? Well, especially not in the golf. I mean, they need, to, they need to do something about the Atlantic, number one. The fact that we have two days in the Atlantic is ridiculous. So they need to extend the Atlantic as well. And the Gulf said, I don't see hook and line fishermen hurting the population of red snapper in the Gulf for a long time to come. There is a lot of red snappers. I know a few guys that used to long line out there. 
in the golf and they're telling me that spots that they used to go catch grouper on all these spots used to hold all these gags they do nothing but hold red snappers anymore like what they're saying the problem is is that a lot of these reds are pushing out fish that would normally live on a spot they're coming in and they're literally they're so aggressive and there's so many of them that they're driving other fish out away so you get to a spot and there's nothing but red snappers there's no more hogs there's no more groupers you know so that i could see as being a little bit of an issue but as far as you know keeping the recreational guy from keeping some of those fish it it just doesn't make any sense to me there's so many of those fish that population of fish is so healthy it should be open all year long you know, really, if you think about it, but hey. I mean, they're they sure, they do for whatever you know, reason there, there are certainly plenty of spots where uh, you could go and, and catch way more red snapper than you could go on your very best day in the very best season on the very best conditions to catch mutton snapper, right? Like, <laughs> and, and that's open all year long and you can do that all year long. And, but I don't know, maybe, maybe it'll happen. I, I did get some, uh, I, I was optimistic you know, after talking to him about the Goliath grouper that, that they would probably open that further. And it would, I, I was just glad to see that they opened it at all, which I think spoke to the fact that the, the rebound of the population was undeniable. There, there's just no way that you could, you could deny that there were tons of them out there and enough there's to t- there's so many harvest at least some. Right. But you know, that's a lot of that is, is, uh, Really, you can you can voice your opinion. You can you can participate in the angler studies and all that stuff, but still fairly out of our control. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, I think if we put up enough of a fit, I think they'll do something about it. I mean, how could I mean the science is there to back it up? You know, for these red snapper, there's plenty of fish to go around for the commercial industry and the recreational industry at this point. There's really no reason not to open it up. It would do so many good things for the state of Florida, number one, in terms of having other people come. Because Rose Red Snapper Charter guys, they're when the snapper season's open, they're booked every day. Yeah. And if the season's two weeks or seven months, they're going to be booked every day. And I don't see how, you know, us bringing all this money into the state is a bad thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so uh, you said earlier, did you say that, you book, that you're booked 300 days a year? Uh, well, obviously the weather you know, plays a major part, but I probably am fishing close to almost 300 days a year. Wow. That's incredible. And you're doing all of that on other people's vessels. Yes. So, I mean, on occasion, somebody will call me and say, Hey, I don't have a boat or I've got too many people to go on my boat. Can you find me, you know, a good charter boat to take them on? So I do some of that from time to time, but 97% of it is on the private boat taking people out, showing them what to do, how to catch fish on their boat. Now, one of the things that, um, you know, in my experience, a good boat and a charter boat has that some people don't is a good live well system. And uh, you're you're live bait fishing. How often do you get on somebody's boat and they just do, you know, you're, you're used to 150 gallons worth of live well in your boat and you get on and they've got a, they've got a 12 gallon live well that's also used as a cooler. And, uh, you know, what, what do you do in that situation? Like, I work with what I've got. <laughs> I do the best with what I got. You know, I show up and I, I, in my nature, sometimes sure I find problems, but soon after my next step is to solve the problem. So lots of times I'll show up and the anchor won't be right or, you know, the, and usually the first trip's like a shakedown. I try to get them prepared in the beginning, but I, it's hard for me to say, hey, spend $3,000 before we ever go to make sure you got all the right stuff. I try to go get a feel for what they want to do, their level of patience, what they want to catch, how much work they're willing to put in to do so. And then from there, I have them get all the tackle, the equipment, everything they need. But sometimes, you know, I show up and it's a 10 gallon well, barely circulates. And what I'll do is I'll, like I said, I'll make the best. I'll go get some squid. I'll go do some deep dropping. Or instead of worrying about catching herring, something that needs a lot of space to swim, I'll go try and catch, you know, a dozen grunts because they're going to sit in the bottom corner of the well. They don't need that much space or some thin fish. And then I'll go fish with that. So I just work with what I've got when I show up. And then if a customer wants to work with me on improving, you know, their tackle or their their vessel in any way, adding rod holders or changing things around, I'm there to help them and guide them through it. But yeah. for the most part, I you know, that's something I deal with probably 50% of the time. Just I show up and just don't have all the tools, but 
I show them what, how to put catch fish with the tools they got. Do you think that that makes you a better angler yourself? I think, like I said, I think every day that I go out there and I have to deal with these problems, I learn more and more ways to do things. I definitely think that makes me a better fisherman on a day-to-day basis for sure. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, getting out there and realizing, you know, the bite's on and you don't have an anchor. Like, how are we going to get this done? Like, and, and you know, like an, to anchor in 250 feet of water is that's, that's serious. Like that's serious anchoring. It requires yes, the ball. Most, 90% if, of people aren't prepared to do that. No, no. I mean, charter guides are, you know, that, that think that they're going to do that on a regular basis. But for the most part, I mean, a lot of boats don't even have enough room to carry 600 feet of anchor line. Like, true. so how, how is that going to happen? But I, I just find it kind of interesting that, that you, you continue to put yourself, you find yourself in these situations where you do not have what you need and you've got to improvise and figure out a different way. And, and from my experience, that makes you way better. Because that happens to us on the shooting a TV show all the time, <laughs> all the time. It's like, <laughs> you know, we're going to go out there and we're fishing for bonefish. And, and literally, listen, man, on the best day, we're sneaking in there. And now you've got a camera boat behind you. People are slamming coolers and lids and dropping stuff. And, <laughs> and, and they're like, oh, man, we, you can't catch them like that. We're going right into the sun. You got to come the other way. And you're like, <laughs> listen, man. We're lucky to even get in here. And, right. And you want me to come the other way? It's like, we're not going to make a TV show unless you put it in the other way. It's like, uh, okay, well, I guess we're polling all the way around here. And you know what happens? More times than not, if we're patient enough, you can actually make it happen. What seemed like a total impossibility, total impossibility, you can poll all the way around, take your time, pull directly into the sun. They're sitting on the other side with the sun at their back so that you're lit up and you look beautiful on TV, but you're pulling directly into the sun. You can't see anything. It's the worst possible situation you could be in, but that's right, what you need. Vision. But for TV, that's the best possible situation. And so somehow you get it done. And I mean, there have been days where I've just been like, I don't know how we did that. I would have never believed that was possible. But because it's out of necessity, it's not even necessity. It's this is the way it has to be. So you do it until you get it done. Right. And of course we blow, we blow, we, for every one time that it works, there's a dozen times that it doesn't. Right. So. Yeah. Well, that's what people don't see that goes into all this stuff. You yeah. know, even just a regular fishing ship, they just see the boat leaving the dock and coming back. They don't see. You know, the rigging of the rods, the, the few phone calls you make the night before to kind of try to find out what the conditions were in certain areas, what was caught, so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. That doesn't mean the next day the stuff's going to be the same, but you kind of get a feel for what's going on. So there's so much preparation, so much that goes into this stuff that people don't even see. I can't even imagine adding all that and the fact that you have to make a TV show on top of it. Oof. Well, it just seems like it it yeah it can be challenging but that's that's actually the fun part and that's where the creativity comes in and and uh the creativity and just the, in in the fishing part of it is is kind of interesting um we'll we'll finish this up by asking you a couple of different questions about one of the things that uh I've, I've gotten some really interesting answers on this one what do you think the like from the time that you were fishing with your dad like we talked about as a as a kid to today what do you think one of the technological advances that we've had in fishing has made the biggest difference in catching fish. Braided line, maybe mm -hmm. one of them. That's a common answer. And, and for your, in your world, how has braided line changed what, what you do? You know, considering that I like the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. We're in South Florida where we have to deal with a lot of current you know, before the advent or before we invented braid, you just couldn't reach these places because, you know, mono was too thick and drag, you had too much drag, too much stretch. So, you know, braid literally opened up all these fisheries to us. I mean, sure, there's commercial guys that were going out on a big scale and, and catching a lot of these drowned fish, you know, in this deep water. But on a recreational basis, 
I think one of the biggest advantages that have come along, you know, to us catching more fish is, is braided line. That's one of them. I mean, there's a few, but braided line is a big one that comes to mind for me because I use so much of it. Yeah. I mean, and, and even how it's uh, uh, changed the equipment that we use, like in order to drop 2000 feet of, of 80 pound test, you had this reel that nobody was going to pick up out of the rod holder. It was just going to be in like a Jaws kind of situation of you had this giant imagine. reel. And now yeah. you could do the same thing with a with a small spinning reel. I mean, literally, you could put that much line, braided line on a on a small spinning reel or small for the, you know small compared to that, right? Uh, and actually get it to the bottom. That's that's really incredible. It's changed, and, it, and on the inshore side, braid had uh, equal changes being able to throw small lures a long distance to to fish for a fish like a tarpon uh, in, in a situation where the only thing that you could throw at that tarpon was a fly. And there's only going to be so many people that can throw the fly in there. And there's only so many people that are interested in the fly. But, right. but you open it up with the braid. What You, you mentioned that there are a few others. I, I'd be interested to hear you know, maybe two others that you think are, have been major, major innovations. Well, I think that using the uh, the new software like Seymour Maps and like some of these ch other charts, Standard Map and some of these other mapping companies, Strike Lines, with them mapping the ocean floor and providing that to you know the recreational because guy because again I'm sure a lot of these commercial guys had some of these maps you know before the recreational guy did, but them opening up you know this this part of of the industry to recreational guys and allowing them to see the bottom that they're fishing on. I mean, obviously they don't have coverage of the whole state, but there's a lot of coverage out there. That's been a huge help in not only finding new spots, you know, for me, but also, you know, learning my area in terms of, okay, well, I've fished this wreck a thousand times growing up as a kid, but now I can see how it lays on the bottom. Now I can see why I used to always catch groupers on the Northwest corner of it, because there's a little piece that fell off and there's a ledge there. So it allows you to see the actual ocean floor that you're fishing on top of. And that for me has been a huge help. Yeah. Um, I you mean, know, because the, I can learn where spot where fish sit on certain spots. You know, stuff. for the, for the inshore angler, um, the same thing happened with aerial photography and, and, and Google maps and, and, and Google earth and stuff like that is like you, you, you're like, this flat has always been better than that one. They're not, they're right next to each other. I never see fish over here and I see them over here. And then you just can't figure it out because you can't see the forest for the trees. You're down in it. You can't figure it out. You're like, they look exactly the same. I don't know why fish are here and they're not over there. And then you see it on Google maps or Google earth or something. And you're like, Oh, I see the, the, it's a current thing. The current comes in through here like this, this is fast water. That seems to be slow water. And you can, you know, it all, you piece it together with, a, with an aerial see, like, photo. The whole picture. Yeah. You see the whole, you see the whole thing or it's, or it's a, it's adjacent to deeper water, which, which maybe you could have figured out, but sometimes, I don't know, maybe there's a pothole there that, you know, up in the Everglades or something where you're, you're, you're usually fishing in, in, uh, uh, muddy water and you can't really see the bottom that well. And, but when you get to the aerial photos, you can see that, that it's a little deeper right there. And that's where the fish are consistently. You, one time as a kid, I, me and my dad, were going to go fish the park. We only get to, get to go there a couple times a year. We love fishing up there. So I jumped on Google earth, you know, and I was like, let me see if I can find some spots. I want to look at some new areas up near like the Harney and those areas, you know, way up there in the middle of nowhere. So sure enough, I get on there and I find these flats. I find the lay down on the flats, you know, like on the edge around the, the tip of the island where there's a tree laying down. I normally wouldn't have been able to see and I could see the current rips around there. And I was able to find, you know, all these spots. I had never been there. And we go there and I printed out the, you know, the Google map shot so I could bring it with me like a chart. And I was able, we went out there and crushed it. Got a bunch of redfish and a bunch of snook in a spot we had never been. But I'll tell you what, all the spots that we looked at on Google Earth and said, man, that looks like there'd be some fish behind that or in this mm -hmm. eddy or here. And they were there. It helped out immensely. Yeah. You know, it helped us greatly. So there's another there's another uh, technological uh, advancement that, that has helped. Let's finish up with one more. What Can you think of one more? Well, um, I think the GPS getting you dialed in a little more as opposed to like a Lowrance, you know, getting you only in the area, I think has helped us a lot too. Yeah. Um, you know, especially me on, on, on my day to day basis. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, that's cool, man. This has been a, it's been a really good conversation. I, I, I've, I've learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of other people learned a lot. And, I hope so. Um, you know, if, if people wanted to, uh, 
to use your services? What would they, how would they do that? Uh, best two places to get me is, you know, they can find me on Instagram. They can see a catalog of everything I've been catching. Um, and that's C-A-P-T, Mutton Mike D, um, you know, Cat Mutton Mike D. Or they can go to my website, which is just muttonmike.com. And that has all the information you know, regarding, you know, stuff I use, stuff they should bring, stuff I bring, trip types, where we can go, what we can catch, what it costs. All the information is up there if they're interested in going on a trip. That's awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge. And uh, it's cool to get to know you a little bit. Well, uh, it's a pleasure being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's cool to get to speak to you after watching the show for years and years as a kid growing up. It's been an absolute pleasure. And again, I really appreciate you having me on the show. All right, Mike. Thanks, man. We'll we'll do it again uh, after you, you catch Tom. another one of those big yellow fins, maybe. Or a blue fin. Yeah, man. I'm, catch a blue yeah, fin. I'm sure I'll get my shot soon. <laughs> I'm sure you will, too. All right, man. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Tom.